So welcome everyone to this uh, parallel session on building resilient e-IDSR systems in Sierra Leone. My name is uh, Johan Sabe from the University of Oslo and I'll moderate this session as, as far as practically possible. We have two presenters for this session. I will just briefly introduce them before I'll, I'll hand over uh, the floor to the presenters. So first we have Bridget Magoba from Apinet. Uh, she's a public health informatics specialist with four years experience in disease surveillance information system. And she has been involved in um, setting up eIDSR system in Sierra Leone. The second presenter is Kalle Hedberg from his South Africa. Uh, as you can see, he has uh, long experience in the field of HIS and also uh, a pilot, known as a pilot in the HISP network. So without uh, much more uh, ado, I'll give the word to Bridget. And we have around 30 minutes for Bridget and Kalle to present. And any questions, if you could write those in the community of practice, we will bring them up after the presentations. So Bridget, please, um, you can go ahead and share your presentation now. Okay. Thank you, Johan. Um, share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see. Yeah, good afternoon, good morning. Um, I'm Bridget Magova from Affinet, Sierra Leone. Um, I'm presenting on the electronic case-based surveillance system in Sierra Leone. Just to give a brief, um, in Sierra Leone, um, they, we, we currently have um, the weekly um, surveillance reporting system, which is aggregate. Then uh, also the case-based um, electronic disease surveillance system. So I'm going to mainly um, focus on the case-based um, disease surveillance system. So um, in Sierra Leone, and the Ministry of Health uh, with its partners, um, CDC, his South Africa, Affinet, um, have set up the electronic case-based surveillance system, which um, reports um, 20 plus notifiable diseases. So um, it, this was set up since 2018 with support from his South Africa, as Kale will also add on, um, in the initial stages, we, we developed uh, the enrollment. It is a tracker program. So it has um, several stages as we're going to see the next slides. Um, then the system went through several revisions um, uh, through partners WHO and CDC with the Ministry of Health um, under the Directorate of Health Security and Emergencies. And then it was pilot, piloted in four districts out of 16. And uh, in February, when um, a COVID outbreak came up, uh, we, we expanded on the very existing case-based disease surveillance system that we had and incorporated COVID-19 um, as one of the notifiable medical conditions in the country. So in Sierra Leone, we did not develop a, a new, um, a new um, instance for COVID-19. We built on what was already existing. So um, during the pandemic, um, the, the Ministry of Health um, relied on the case-based disease surveillance for information management, um, which was uh, rolled out um, in the 16 districts. And it was what is, what is being reported for, report for COVID-19 data up to date. Um, currently, we are expanding um, the, the system to the other districts. Um, for the other um, notifiable diseases besides COVID-19. So this was a lesson from the Ebola outbreak where we needed to, um, to, to use the existing uh, applications to build on um, um, other, new, other new information systems or other new um, diseases that come up. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a tracker program that has different stages. One is the case registration, which is the enrollment, and this is mainly um, captured by the health facility staff using mobile devices. And um, Sierra Leone, we are using tablets. 
um, during the, the weekly disease surveillance reporting, um, which was rolled out to the entire country, each first health facility received a tablet for reporting. So with the electronic space disease surveillance, it was easier for us to, to use the existing um, devices, the existing resources for us to, uh, to roll out this, this system. So the facilities already have the tablets and there, that is, those are the resources that we are using uh, for data capture at facility level. Then we have the lab request and the lab result stage. The lab request mainly is used by, um, captured by the district health management team, while the lab results um, stage um, is mainly captured by the laboratory technicians from the different testing labs. Then we have different case investigation forms. Um, each disease has uh, a case investigation form. Besides some, um, some diseases that are classified, like for, um, for viral hemorrhagic fevers are classified in, uh, in Ebola and other diseases. Then we also have final outcome that uh, closes the entire case. So this is the entire flow of the, of the, of the program. So this is the data flow of, um, of the case-based disease surveillance system. Everything starts from the health facility and the health facility notifies um, the case using a tablet, um, that is the Android, um, the Android application. So then a notification is sent through SMS and email to the district health management team. And uh, they, they fill a lab request form based on what they find on ground when they visit the facility. Then uh, depending on what, um, what assessment they've made, and uh, then they'll have to fill uh, the, case the lab request form as well as capture it in the system. Um, and the district uh, health management team, they are able to use um, either the um, Android um, application or the web application on the computer because they have access to both um, the tablet and um, a computer or a laptop. So they go ahead and also capture information on the case investigation based on the disease that is being reported. Um, then the lab, the lab that receives the sample also um, captures results into the system. Um, after analyzing the, the sample that has been collected. Though we still have some gaps on, uh, on the results capture, the lab is still um, resisting on capturing lab, lab results directly into the system. And currently we, um, we receive results through Excel files, which then the surveillance team will be the one to capture the, the lab results directly into the system from the Excel files. Then um, the national level um, analyzes the data that is sent from um, the different reporting, um, reporting levels for decision making at the emergency operation center, as well as sharing information to, with other ministries of health departments and other, um, that other ministries in the country. So um, as I mentioned that we use the existing case-based disease surveillance system to, to, to cover COVID-19 in February in February um, this year. So um, COVID-19 as, 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 as because it is a respiratory um, illness, it was categorized under the group of acute respiratory illnesses where we have the SARS, the, the MERS and the influenza. So um, that's where we categorize COVID-19. And uh, we use the, the WHO, um, existing forms, the investigation forms, the contact tracing forms, then we, that is what we configured into um, the system to, to meet the reporting needs for, um, for COVID-19. And initially it had uh, questions of um, animal markets, contacts with animals, which um, eventually became irrelevant in Sierra Leone. So we went on um, revising the form um, uh, eventually, we, we had to capture in some other, um, some other sections that are relevant in Sierra Leone um, aspect compared to the general um, WHO um, assessment. So we also added the contact tracing and quarantine monitoring tool, um, which is still being used right now. So we have two programs. We have the, the NMC, uh, which is covering the information on the COVID-19 
uh, investigations. Then we also have the contact tracing, which is a separate program and contact monitoring. Then we also have uh, uh, the port of entry passenger locator event. We were using this at, um, for air travelers, which we are going to expand to land, um, land travelers as well. Currently, Sierra Leone is, is, is planning to open up um, land borders. So we are going to use the same event program to capture data on, um, on travelers through land. Currently, we are using it for travelers um, through air. Also, we are using it before, um, at the beginning of the outbreak, before um, the airport closed. So it was very informative for us to tell um, where the, the cases were coming, the confirmed cases we are traveling from, and so on and so forth. Um, including quarantine monitoring. So we also have a program on um, quarantine site um, monitoring, and this is uh, an integration from another um, application called ComCare, which has been introduced by the Directorate of Science and Technology. Um, so um, this um, program pulls data from the ComCare app into um, the, the tracker program in, in DHIS2, which um, gives us information on the different quarantine sites um, during this outbreak. So this is a, a multiple data flows into um, electronic space disease surveillance that we have currently for COVID-19. Um, it all starts from, uh, from a suspected case which might be reported either through a health facility or through a toll-free line um, from the community, which is free to everyone in, the, in, in Sierra Leone. Then, um, then it gets to the case investigation team, and the case investigation team will have to, to get on ground either the health facility or in the community and uh, fill the case investigation form, which was already configured in, um, in DHIS2. Then the data team goes ahead and captures this information into the system. Um, same applies to the quarantine. Um, uh, before I move to quarantine, the case investigation team um, will have to as well line list um, contacts of the case that has been um, identified. Then um, a sample will be collected and sent to the lab. So with that, uh, when lab results return, as I mentioned earlier that we still have a gap with the laboratory team, the laboratory team um, does not capture the results directly into the system, but they share the results in Excel. So the surveillance data team goes ahead and captures the results in the system on behalf of uh, the laboratory technicians. So that is still a gap on our side, um, but we are still pushing on to um, encourage the, the lab team to capture the results directly into the system. And also looking at the workload um, during the outbreak, the lab team is so strained and stretched um, to the extent that they are unable to, to capture data directly into, into the system. So again, uh, when, it's, when I go back to the flow, we also have the quarantine team that has to, keep the con to pick the contact list from the system that was already captured from the, uh, by the data team. So this is what they use to keep monitoring um, the contacts that are in quarantine uh, until they complete the 14 days. So in addition, um, there's also a small daily aggregated data from ComCare that I mentioned in the previous slides and that we can also use to assess how many, um, how many contacts are quarantined in the specific quarantine sites. Um, then we also have the case management team. The case management team updates data on, uh, on the admission information of the cases and also um, outcome information on the cases, deaths, recoveries, evacuations, and any other um, clinical-based information from their end. So we have um, some key achievements and challenges that we, we have. Um, we're able to capture information on uh, the confirmed probable suspected cases on time. Um, because each district is able to capture this information on their end and national level um, analyzes and is able to make decisions based on that data. There are minor discrepancies between the numbers that we have in the system vis-a-vis -vis what the, the, the situation room um, is reporting. 
uh, manually. There's also limited capacity to capture all the negative lab results. So uh, focus is given um, on the positive results, then negative, um, we compile the Excel sheets shared by the lab and we're able to import them into um, the system. We've configured key indicators, like confirmed cases, confirmed deaths, confirmed recoveries, and so on, case facility rates, attack rate, and we're able to respond to any data requests from, um, from partners and Ministry of Health as well in relation to, to the outbreak. Um, there are also no address geo, geo data, geo data into the system because data is captured from the hard copies. We have a gap of, um, of uh, tablets, so um, users are not able to collect this information directly from the field. So we use addresses that are captured um, in the system for us to get the, the geolocation and we're able to get the maps of where these cases um, are coming from. So we, uh, we also have information on the contacts and quarantine monitoring through the system. And this is also done at district level. So it is, um, it is accurate data from the district. Uh, we're able to get the transmission chains um, from the system. With, with transmission chains, we are also making use of, uh, of Go data with also the relationship um, application in DHIS2 to come up with the transmission chains. Um, data integration is also case management for outcome and clinical data. This um, was, um, was uh, this started the midway of the outbreak. Um, it wasn't um, something that was easy at the start to, to incorporate case management data into the existing surveillance data. Um, then we're able to, to capture data using Android and currently there's a, a rollout at the facility level that is taking place. Though we still have challenges with the SMS channel um, uh, submission, so we are relying on zero rating the instances um, for, for, for submission. Email and SMS notifications are also active at the different reporting levels. And we've also deployed the system for COVID-19 in all the 16 districts. So all the 16 districts are able to report um, COVID-19 suspected, probable, and uh, confirmed cases, including contacts and quarantine um, cases, uh, contacts from their different districts. But the challenge we have is um, some facilities have all devices that are 4.4.4 KitKat, which uh, which we are facing challenges with um, using the, the application. Then we've also had uh, the mobile device management previously, where 80% of the devices were configured. However, uh, it, was get, it was becoming costly for government, and now we've resorted to using Uplock, which, is, uh, which, is, which can't be accessed remotely. So we still have that gap. And we have visualizations with, uh, with data from the port of entry, with data from case-based um, surveillance, contact tracing and line listing, um, the traveler quarantine follow-up and case management. We are able to pull out information, um, such visualization, the maps, the tables, the graphs, um, and transmission chains as well. Then we also have displays. We are making use of uh, the display uh, application, which was uh, developed by his Uganda. So we display on the screens at the emergency operation center, including the, the situation room of, um, of the response. So they're able to see up to date information from time to time. Um, some examples of data use include we've, um, we've used the reports, the maps, the charts um, in the situation room to make um, decisions. We are using the same information to external portals. So um, external portals with um, Directorate of Policy Planning and Intervention pulls data from um, the case-based disease surveillance system um, on, um, on the, from the data of COVID-19. Then we use that data to also determine the hotspot areas um, for surge, for sentinel surveillance, and monitor the transmission chains as well. Um, data, trans, data dissemination also to other ministries, for example, Ministry of Gender for inclusion of gender, um, 
in the treatment centers and also um, in quarantine. Um, same applies to a directorate of nutrition to, um, to include um, child food and dietary consideration at the treatment centers and uh, quarantine homes and facilities, and also a psychosocial support. Um, this data is also used to make public health decisions like, like opening schools and, uh, and so on. So the next steps with the ECBDS rollout is the, we're looking at the transmission chain analysis using the relationship app, supporting multiple tracker uh, programs. So as I mentioned earlier, this one we are looking at uh, using two applications, DHIS2 and GoData for comparison. And uh, we are also looking at uh, including clinical data from case management. Currently, um, what we have is uh, the, out, the outcome information, the deaths, the recoveries, and so on. We're also looking at operational data from case management, the bed capacity, bed utilization, and uh, the admission rate, and so on. Um, then also the Comcare application, which we've already started um, the integration. This is something that we are also continuing with so that we are able to have data from Comcare application flow into um, um, ECBDS. Then um, integrating the eman first application, which was developed by another, by another agency into ECBDS. So the main aim here is uh, we are focusing on having uh, um, this system uh, be the center for uh, COVID-19 data. So any other um, small applications, we integrate them into, uh, we integrate them to ECBDS so that it becomes the central, um, the central data for COVID-19. Then uh, we are also looking at a possible inclusion of uh, key logistics data like masks, availability of PPE, drugs, and so on. Um, we are also looking at uh, tracking the other conditions like maternal deaths and perinatal uh, perinatal deaths um, as independent programs within the system. Then also better analytical integration between ECBDS and EIDSR. EIDSR is the weekly aggregate data which is already uh, rolled out um, throughout the entire country in the 16 districts and they've been reporting for the past um, one and a half years through that platform. So we are looking at comparing the cases that are being reported uh, within the case-based disease surveillance vis-a-vis um, -vis what is reported um, on a weekly basis. Um, and also um, including the disease-related monthly aggregate data. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I'll now give the word to Kalle. And remember, you can, you can write your questions at the community of practice. Uh, if you do that, it's also a possibility for us to get back to these questions uh, later, also after the presentations and the conference. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Kalle here talking from uh, Oslo. Uh, are you able to see my um, screen? Yes. Yes. All right. So I have only about five minutes. So I will mostly talk about the more sort of strategic uh, aspects of uh, this uh, development. Now, at the beginning of the um, uh, COVID pandemic, what was interesting was that in almost all the webinars that I took part in, everybody with experience, particularly from the Ebola epidemic, was stressing the need to use existing systems. And that was a hard won experience during Ebola. We saw how an epidemic or a pandemic with a high public profile ends up being a proliferation grenade or a fragmentation grenade with lots and lots of different actors and stakeholders jumping in and saying, we have the solution for this, we have the solution for that. And the net result of it is that the, uh, the um, both the public focus and the, the management focus tend to be sort of diversified. People are tracing up all kinds of avenues and very often the basic methodologies that are known to work and which the health sector is familiar with ends up actually suffering and not getting the 
support that they require. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about integration between uh, IDSR, which is uh, integrated disease surveillance and, and response, and, um, and yeah, some of the implications for uh, DHIS2. So the problem we have seen, and I guess most of you are pretty familiar with the, the, the scene in the United States, which is in a way extreme. Because the U.S. have gone from a situation where they, during Ebola, actually had a very coordinated and concerted effort, and I think played an absolutely vital role, particularly the U.S. Armed Forces, but also CDC, in assisting the three countries in West Africa to, to beat down and, and finally uh, uh, get rid of the, the epidemic. They've gone from that to a completely I would say almost chaotic situation where politicians, where scientists, where all kinds of conspiracy theories, etc., is constantly uh, creating a scene of, of chaos and pulling also the population in all kinds of, of directions. And I don't want to go into details on that, but we've seen similar things in a lot of other countries to a greater or a lesser extent. extent. Few countries Sierra Leone, for instance, Norway, for instance, considerably better, I would say, than average. But even here, you've seen some of the same things about, you know, new apps being thrown out as the solution to things. And then after two or three or four weeks, it turns out to not uh, work. Uh, you obviously have consultant companies. You have all kinds of app developers for the best of, of intentions, uh, you know, pushing their apps and seeing it as a way of, I would say, uh, making themselves known as a, as a way of, of marketing. And finally, which we have seen to some extent in, in Sierra Leone, I'd say, is that within ministries and within sections of ministries, these pandemics ends up being also a venue for sort of turf wars. Different uh, bodies are, are all paying lip service to full integration and full coordination, etc. But in practice, they are actually doing their own things and, and you know, waving the the flags. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we've, we've seen a number of new apps and whatever being pushed out. And even if so far, at least everybody is saying that, well, the data should go into the ECBDS, but so far it hasn't. And again, it comes back to this, this um, fact that during normal times, the sea surveillance, particularly in low income countries, but also in wealthier countries, is not seen as a very high priority. It's seen as boring. It's a lot of drudgery. You know, you're, you're monitoring things on a, on a day by day basis for years and years, suddenly something happens. So we have seen it in Europe, for instance, where very, very, very few countries have still maintained their large uh, depots, for instance, of, of PPEs and other kinds of, of equipment. Most of them found that to be not cost effective, so they got rid of it. Then you have a pandemic and you are in a crisis mode. Everybody is, uh, is screaming and, and, and fighting over the same resources. So a little bit of the background was then that the ECBDS was based on the template that uh, I was part of developing for South Africa, which is used there for malaria at the moment based on the fact that normally uh, notifiable diseases will have one common registration form for all diseases. Uh, they would typically have one sort of uh, process for dealing with laboratory data and getting laboratory results back, but then it diversifies based on the disease. Although again, we, we decided in Sierra Leone that most of the acute respiratory infections are so similar that we can group them together. And you can do that with some other diseases, but typically you have uh, a diversification. And in tracker uh, program terms, that means that you have multiple uh, case investigation stages, basically one for each disease, because what you're investigating will vary depending on, on the disease. And, um, but it was, <clears throat> the whole design has been that it's very easy to add new diseases. It's easy to add new processes, follow-ups, like, uh, like uh, follow-up visits and so forth, because you can just add another stage. You can add uh, uh, a few data elements, etc. So it was designed to actually grow over time because we know that um, 
uh, you know, since 2000, we've had SARS, MERS, Ebola, swine flu, uh, a range of zoonotic diseases, particularly, but new diseases. And we know experts estimate there's around 40,000 viruses in the animal world. Some of them will definitely jump to humans, become zoonotic diseases. So, you know, it just doesn't make any sense that with every new such zoonotic disease, we end up having to create a new set, new databases, new tools, new everything. It just don't make any sense. And uh, I think it's also often underestimated the strain this poses on the staff. Because again, one of the things we have seen in Sierra Leone, because we were, we had just sort of piloted the ECBDS when the pandemic struck, was that we had huge, we have had huge problems weaning people off just using their own Excel sheets. We, in sort of parallel to the ECBDS capturing all the data and providing it and increasingly taking over, people have been running all kinds of Excel sheets, you know, in, in sort of parallel, which we are only slowly then managing to, to, uh, to pull in. Um, Another future aspect, which we know gonna, gonna grow stronger, is all the ideas around big data, social data mining, all kinds of variable devices, et cetera, et cetera, right? These torrent of technology solutions will just increase. But we also see that few of them live up to expectations, at least for now, all right? There's a lot of hype, very little actual impact on we see now with the pandemic. Most countries ends up predominantly relying on contact tracing, on following up, on treating people efficiently, et cetera, and on traditional methods like social distances, wearing masks, et cetera, right? So these fancy new technical solutions generally don't have much impact on the epidemic. It might change in the future, but for now, it's really, really critical that we establish integrated systems that can be maintained, that are not too fragmented, you know, so if you're, if you're sitting with five or six or seven or eight databases, it's much more resource intensive than if you're sitting with one or two. So we so, need to maintain this. So Ola, may I ask you to, to wrap it up yeah. now to leave some time for questions, please. Yeah. And, um, and um, the, the critical part here, I think, is in addition to maintaining an integrated IDSR system, is also to start more actively combine surveillance data and normal service data, which is traditionally monthly and aggregated, but increasingly also might be tracker type of data. And it's critical, I think, going forward to better, uh, shall we say, design the health data so that it's possible, it's, it's more possible, it's easier to combine that with social and economic data to assess impact of different interventions that you're doing in a pandemic situation. And the uh, implication for DHIS2, that's my last slide here, is that it fits as an integrated platform, these key requirements, but the current tracker capture is not optimal for IDSR. Uh, we are working hard on trying to, 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 shall we say, fix that with a new capture app more possibilities for line listing type of editing and a, and a range of other things that makes it easier to use for these uh, uh, specific things. We're still having some challenges with like the SMS channel on Android, but again, that's also being uh, resolved and we are working on improving analytics and, and uh, line listing. What I think we are missing is better tools for communicating this surveillance data with population, so not only to other experts, it's, as I said, integration with social economic models. And it is generally to increase the awareness among decision makers and politicians that health and disease is equal to security. And it needs the same time of long-term investments as, as politicians generally are very happy to put into you know, military hardware and that kind of thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bridget and Kalle. We have time, we have five minutes. We should uh, quit a bit early to leave time for people uh, to arrange the next session, but I'm gonna share my screen now and show, um, if you stop sharing your screen, Kalle, there are some questions on the community practice. Uh, feel free to add more there. 
if I share my screen and um, you should be able, I hope now, to see some questions. And I believe we can start at the, at the top and there's a question here. I hope you see it, Bridget, uh, from Solveig Danielsen. Uh, you mentioned resistance among staff to refer the data and the system. Can you say a bit more about that? Did you investigate the reasons for this? Yeah, um, thank you, Delson. One is uh, they, they, they are resisting change. Uh, they feel more comfortable using the Excel sheets that they've, uh, that they've been using. Um, despite um, several trainings that uh, they go through, they feel more comfortable um, capturing data on the Excel sheets. But also um, connectivity um, could also be a, a challenge. Um, because we have labs um, uh, the districts not in the capital city as well. So um, the fact that we don't have the SMS channel working yet, um, data bundles becomes a challenge. Um, that's why I mentioned that we are looking at zero rating the, the, the instances so that this can no longer be a challenge. Um, but also they feel, they, feel um, they are taking a lot of time um, capturing data through the, 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 the web-based system, as well as um, they need to maintain their Excel sheet. So they're looking at also maintaining uh, parallel systems. Um, one other thing that they, that they were raising was uh, um, um, confidentiality of uh, patient information, um, which we, 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 we explain to them that this data is only accessed by people who have um, access to it. Um, who need to have access to it. So as, as we move on, we are, we are able to keep explaining and, you know, um, convincing them to, to accept the change from Excel to, um, to the web-based platform. So, so far there's an improvement uh, um, compared to how we started. If I can add uh, something here, also uh, comment on some of the other questions. Let me say, resistance to change is part of the reason. Uh, we also saw when uh, travelers started paying for, um, for lab tests that the, the lab tended to prioritize that. So there might be, you know, money might play a role here too. It's often one of the reasons why different sections want their own systems because it's a way of getting additional resources. But in all fairness, uh, last week when somebody was sort of questioning the labs uh, why they were resistant to capturing data directly, the response was quite swift and the person was invited to come to the lab, dress up in full PPE gear, uh, spend a few hours in a lab that deals with live Ebola viruses and live COVID viruses and see how easy it is uh, with, uh, with hands in gloves and whatever to actually use the current uh, technology we have with the uh, touch screens and whatever. So there is also an aspect of that. I don't think most of our tools are very suitable for hands in three layers of gloves, et cetera. We, you also know if you have, have gloves on how difficult it is to even you know, deal with your own smartphone. Uh, Eric is asking about the number of cases. Well, we're talking 15 to 20,000 cases. I know that um, I have so far geolocated about 12,000, between 12 and 13,000 cases. Uh, so totally we, we're talking close to 20,000. Obviously a lot less than some countries, but also uh, not, not small numbers for a disease surveillance system. And Bram is asking about aggregated weekly report and case-based report data. And for now, that's definitely happening in parallel. And the data is not, partially it's used to identify gaps and whatever, but it's also not directly relatable because the weekly aggregated data are suspects. Whereas in uh, um, the, the case-based system, we are obviously wanting to know which of the suspect cases are confirmed cases. And this is the same for malaria systems. You're normally focusing predominantly on confirmed cases. But over time, I think those of us who, who look some years ahead here, we can see that uh, for all diseases with reasonable numbers, and that means up to two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 cases maximum per year, 
it makes sense to move to case-based disease surveillance and then gradually phase out the, the weekly aggregate stress becomes aggregates for the, for the case-based data. But for, for some, like malaria in, uh, in Sierra Leone is, is also notifiable and they have, you know, two, three million cases or more a year. There is no way that, that it doesn't make sense to have that as, uh, as for, for case-based disease surveillance because there is no capacity to investigate and no meaning really. It, has, it doesn't really have any meaning to, to investigate it. Other countries like South Africa, which has 10,000 cases, they, that's all case-based and not, no, no aggregated data at all. We're doing completely away with the aggregated data collection. So this is a process and uh, I would expect it to take uh, two, three, uh, four years. Thank you. Okay, Carla, thank you. I think we have to stop there. Um, but uh, please uh, keep adding questions if you have. And, and I encourage uh, Bridget and Carla and, and others to, to visit this uh, page on the community of practice again to follow up on this discussion. Uh, thank you to everyone who came to listen to this and the big special thanks to Bridget Magoba and Kalle Hedberg for presenting um, and I'll see you in, in the next session. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>